<laughs> okay, so it started recording now. The recording option is on. So yeah, let us start today's uh, Friday colloquium as usual, as is, as has been already scheduled. Uh, 25th September is a date for Sana Ito. Sana Ito is from Japan, uh, as you know from the bio note, and I will also be introducing her. Uh, let me first thank Sana Ito for agreeing to come over to the online DS uh, and to share her research findings and research work with us. And I really welcome uh, Sana Ito to be there for us and sharing her views uh, for maybe around, say, 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And after that, we will be having a Q&A session. And that's how the things are going on in other occasions as well. So without wasting any more time, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Sanaito. Sanaito is a researcher at the National Institute for the Humanities and Visiting Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies, Kyoto University. She received her PhD in 2019, very recently, from Kyoto University for her doctor doctoral dissertation on disaster and locality in the Kathmandu Valley. She also considers space and locality from the perspective of waste and its handling and is the author of a 2019 article, A Polycentric Waste Management System in the Kathmandu Valley, Nepal, published, that is published in the Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development. So uh, this is in brief uh, what Sanaito is right now doing. And uh, as we can understand that she is a very fresh graduate from the Kyoto University and we are expecting a lot from her, and particularly uh, from a person for the first time in the Center for Himalayan Studies, talking about Himalaya from a different vantage point. I mean, from the vantage point of the East, actually. So looking at Himalaya from the East, particularly from Japan, I hope would be an illuminating experience for us. So I hand over the dais to Sana for her presentation, right? Sana, please take over. Thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, yeah, my name is Sana from Japan, and I just starting my presentation now. Uh, and I need to say sorry uh, because I mistaken on the I made a mistake on my abstract. Uh, abstract shows that the year of the earthquake 2005, but actually it is 2000. Uh, 15. So it's a mistake. So I will talking about the earthquake on 2015. And uh, can you see my presentation now? Not yet? Yeah, your PPT is visible. Please continue. OK. So just I start now. The title of my presentation is The Production of Locality Through Debris and Festival After uh, uh, Festival uh, and uh, Regarding Aftermath of the Golga Earthquake in the Kathmandu Valley. So, on April 25th, 2015, a powerful earthquake with a magnitude of 7.8 struck east and central Nepal. The death toll was around 9,000, and more than 770,000 houses were destroyed. The earthquake left a huge amount of debris as well, which remained for months in the affected areas. P Village, a Nepal village, which is the primary site of this study, and located 10 kilometers southeast of Kathmandu, was severely damaged by the earthquake. 500 houses were destroyed, and debris of collapsed houses obstructed the street of the village. However, this debris was removed when a festival called Sapalu approached. So this study attempts to explore the function of rituals and festivals in the post-disaster recovery process by focusing both on the debris generated by a disaster and a festival that prompted its disposal. 
Based on my case study, I showed that the celebration of a specific festival called Sabalu or in Nepali Gaijatra prompted physical elimination of the debris, an ominous and extraordinary object that visually showed traces of the disaster and that the overall process of removing the debris and celebrating the festival led to the physical and conceptual regeneration of the space in the disaster affected area. Thus, this study suggests that the ritual, religious and cultural practices of a community may serve that community as a means of disaster recovery and resilience. Okay, let's see about uh, previous studies about disasters, especially focusing on debris, spaces, and festivals. Uh, disaster destroys the spaces of people's everyday lives. Hoffman discussed that spaces with lasting effects from disasters, such as scattered debris, make people feel unsafe and insecure. Peterson discussed that the debris carried a double meaning. On the one hand, it is perceived as unclean and inauspicious because it emerged through death, blood, and destruction. On the other hand, it is a symbol of people's lives before a disaster, and hence, it is a subject of people's attachment. Debris is an ambiguous material in this respect. Disaster disrupts time as well as space, and the practices of festivals and rituals attempt to re recover lost space and time. Ueda distinguished two types of time, cyclical time and linear time, in an examination of a festival held in immediate aftermath of the 2004 earthquake in Yamakoshi village, Niigata prefecture, Japan. Cyclical time is normal time, the time experienced in everyday situation. The natural pattern of the seasons and annual events held on specific days are examples of this normal time that progresses in a recur recurring spiral and in which the same cyclical pattern comes regularly. Even if it each year or period is not precisely the same. Conversely, we would argued that the victims of great disasters are thrown into linear time, which extends forward from the past into a future that they could not previously know what would occur next. How long will the evacuation last? When will they be able to return to retrieve, retrieve their belongings? What will happen to the workplaces and farmland that they have left behind? They cannot even predict where they will be tomorrow, next week, month, or year. In the very aftermath of the disaster, people in Harfield Village return to the cyclical time by practicing their annual festival. While living in evacuation center, people rescued boots from the affected village by various means, secured a blue fighting arena near the evacuation center, and held this festival, the blue fighting festival, uh, interacted even after the earthquake. This post-disaster resumption of the festival led to a resumption of everyday life in the cyclical time the residents have previously experienced. So this study discussed the regeneration of local spaces from disaster from a perspective of the production of locality, which Apadurai argued. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the locality that continues to be produced against odds. 
Apatita defined the locality as a structure of feeling produced through relationship and context. Locality is unstable and fragile and easy to dissolve. Variable neighborhood in which locality is variably realized are uh, produced sub substantially by local knowledge. Local knowledge is concerned with right of passages, the building of houses, the organization of pass passages, and so on. So uh, I will be talking about the naval society because the field village is a naval dominant village. Field site called P village have a population around 4,000 and the dominant uh, caste or ethnic group is navals. 90% uh, of the villages are navals. The P village is suburban village which is expanding rapidly. So let's see about the locality in naval society. In the naval society of the Katmandu Valley, both rituals and festivals and the special construction of cities and villages are a part of local knowledge that has produced locality. Navals have formed cities and villages for thousands of years. The center of each city or village is defined as the most sacred place. This construction of spaces has been affirmed and enforced by festivals and rituals. Okay, so let's see the case study in P village. These photos show the very aftermath of the earthquake in P village. Uh, I will now look at uh, I I will look at festivals and locality during the disaster with uh, uh, this village. Uh, what happening on this village and what people do. P village was badly affected by the 2015 earthquake like this photo show. 15 people in P village were killed by the earthquake, including three children, and many were injured. More than 500 houses were destroyed. Almost all houses sustained damage from the earthquake, so most people in the village spent a month in agriculture field, school ground, and any open spaces. The village have seven gates that separate the inside of the village from the outside. Uh, here is the uh, uh, seven, seven gate showing on the map. And there are agriculture fields outside of the gates where people have produced rice and vegetables. The area inside of the gates is called the upside. The outside, including the agriculture field, is called the downside. Recently, people have built houses in downside because of a lack of space inside the village. So there are many houses in downside outside of the gates. So the area is still called downside. So the spatial structure of P village was greatly shaken by the earthquake. The upside of P village became uninhabitable in the aftermath of the earthquake. Debris of destroyed houses had blocked streets throughout the area. In this situation, rumors about supernatural beings had become widely heard. Madhav gave an account of the aftermath of the village at Belu in an interview on February 13, 2017. Uh, residents had been living together in the tent after the earthquake. 
In the nighttime, the village was a dead city. There were sounds of crime in the nighttime. Many people said so, and I had heard as well. It was completely dark in the village at that time. There was no electricity. Yes, the village in the nighttime was really a dead city. There is another narrative about dangerous uh, supernatural beings, or called boot. I visited Asha, Asha, who lived in uh, in P Village, on the evening of September 2015. There were thick carving on old windows of her room, which I had ne not seen. Uh, I have never seen before. Before, they had. Uh, there had always been thin curtains, and usually they were not closed. I asked her, why have you changed the curtains? And she answered, people who have lived in the arcade of the temple said, a child, a child comes, we hear a voice, and run away. After 9 p.m., there were no people outside. So I needed to close the curtain tightly. I never look outside in the night time. There was an opportunity to listen to a story that someone had heard steps and voices and saw a child no one knew, even before the earthquake. Before the earthquake, such phenomena usually occurred in the downside of the village. After the earthquake, however, sighting of wood supernatural beings in upside of the village had increased drastically. Supernatural beings, usually called wood in this village, wander in dark, darkness around crossroad, agricultural field, or forest. They sometimes come into houses, though they usually hide in the darkness. The areas of the village left uninhabited in the aftermath of the earthquake became the spaces where residents reported witnessed, witnessing boot. Madaf used the English term a dead city to describe the situation. Considering that a person could become a dangerous boot, uh, if they died in an accident or in an unnatural way, this expression refers to not only a deadly silent city where nobody lived, but also a city inhabited by wood. The dead and the living meet at the contact zone that transgresses the everyday living world. Pivotage became such a contact zone Tang tangential to the moral, uh, mortal world. Destroyed houses had been left as they were after the earthquake. Thus, a large amount of debris had been scattered around in P village and was blocking streets at of the end of July 2015. People called the debris remaining after segregation uh, mato. Mato is a Nepali term that means soil and also mud. For example, one can say of an agricultural field have the uh, 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 one can say of an agricultural field that this field has good mato. There are many terms that indicate waste, unwanted things, or dirty material in the area. Uh, especially juto, uh, uh, juto indicate things are uh, thought of as dangerous, as they are believed to make a person impure when they are touch touched improperly. How are juto related to matter produced by the earthquake, mud could be treated as a kind of juto because it is related to an earthquake, 
that caused death and ruin. However, things indicated as being murder were not obviously treated as due to infibiage. Nevers usually considered wastage related to death as due to that they should keep away from. Nevertheless, the resident of B village never referred to Mato as Juto, including Mato of houses where people died, and showed no hesitation to touch Mato after the earthquake. Mato that emerged from the earthquake had a trace of ruin. It was true that Mato was a destructive material, but it was difficult to decide whether it should be discarded and if so, how and by whom it should be done. This is Mato in Pivirage. These photos it take on the July 2015. So both boot and mantle were unusual and circumscribed. They appeared in places located in the upside that had been constructed before the earthquake as safe place to live. Boot and mantle were dangerous to the villages. However, these boot and mantle are irregular, ir irregularities that appeared as the result of the disaster and could not be dealt with in everyday practice. To that end, they continue to appear in the village upside for several months. Mato were removed at the beginning of August 2015. Their removal was triggered by Saparu, which is an annual festival for the dead who have died in the year since the previous year's celebration and constitute an important portion of the funerary rites of the Newals. Saparu is a communal festival that featured not only a procession of the families of the dead, but also dances and crowns and skit. Simultaneously, Sapalu is a means to manage this as a community. The dead are a threat not only to their families, but also to the entire people of their locality. Celebrating the festival in the community and ensuring that the dead are properly separated from the living it's necessary for the safety and the sustainability of both the dead themselves and the living members of the community. The procession of Sapalu had been decided by villagers. A procession is a key part of Sapalu. The starting point of procession differs every year. Any neighborhood, which is a starting point, prepares a feast for participants of the festival. The neighborhood members are the main conductors of the whole process of the festival. According to the villagers, a neighborhood that lost an important member during the previous year volunteered for the law. This degradation reflects the character of Sapalu as collective mourning. When asked why you decided to hold the festival, a Sapalu management staff person from the neighborhood, which overtakes the 2015 Sapalu, responded, because it should be done. Uh, 
So with the decision by villagers, preparation of Sapalu was started. In order to hold the Sapalu, which involved a procession around the village, matto that had accumulated on the route of the procession became an obstacle that have that had to be eliminated by the villagers working together as a community. On August 9, 2015, cleanup of matto was started using a bulldozer and a large truck. Villagers chartered heavy vehicles to remove matto. In a narrow alley where no heavy vehicles could be placed, the villagers used a shovel and a hole to break down matto and carry it away. They touched and carried matto without any hesitation. Those who touched matto did not show the aversion they did to judo. In less than two weeks, the matto which had blocked every part of the road was removed. Uh -huh. Here photos show the removal of the debris using uh, both using the heavy heavy vehicles and also by uh, the hand of people. So uh, it's a month before the uh, Sapalu festival. Uh, this photo is just uh, day before the Sapalu festival. So the motto is here is same. Uh, this uh, this street is same street and same angle. So the old motto is removed for the procession. So the month of preparation for Sapalu was also the time when Lake, uh, it's a kind of devil or demon, danced around the village. A male dancer mimicking Lake wearing a red costume and a mask danced around the village to receive money from shops and people. The Lake dance was performed twice a week on Tuesday and Saturday prior to Sapalu. When Mato was removed and Lake began the procession, people started to gather at night to see the Lake dance. There were many people living in temporary shelters at the downside of the village without even dismantling the old houses. Uh, they have no idea when they can rebuild their houses or how to uh, how to get that money to rebuild their houses. This economical and physical situation of their lives did not change with the removal of the mato or lucky dance. However, the atmosphere of the village at night time changed. Rumors of boot did not disappear as soon as Lucky Dance began. People still talking about the boots even after the Sapadu festival. However, when I asked about the boot uh, on August 28th, uh, the, after the Lucky Dance started, Suman said that we don't have to worry about the Buddha because Lake has already come. The 2015 Sapalu was held on August 30. People who participated in the procession gathered in the square in front of the Ganesh temple. 
They, are, they were wearing masks and followed by families of the deceased. The square in front of the temple was neatly cleaned up, but behind the square was still bricks and metal piled like a hill. This photo shows uh, the the left side sh photo showed uh, this that situation. Uh, the masked people is lining, and the, behind of them there is uh, many bricks and metal there. Children dressed as a cow also wandered around the village. They were led by men dressed as cow herds. The group of men who dressed up in female clothes walked around the village as well. The route of Sabaru was almost the usual annual route of the festival, except for a part of the route where the roads were narrow and there were many crumbling houses that could fall down at any moment. So many people enjoyed Sapado Festival of that time. Um, oh, yeah, this is dance here. So, so previous researches had already stated that disaster affected people who have been slung into linear and unpredictable world after a disaster strive to re-establish the routine of rep repetition by conducting an annual festival. After the disaster, uh, in my study site, the celebration of an annual festival was disparated desperately desired by people in the aftermath of the disaster. As the festival was celebrated, the community was reconfigured into a safer space, space in which to live rather than the undesired space it had become in the wake of the earthquake. The very character of Sapalu as a means of managing villagers' relationship and interaction with the dead led to the emotional and psychological aspect to recovery, as well as the material aspect of clearing the debris left as remnant of the disaster. The debris on the street The debris on the streets continued to appeal to the people visually and physically about the extraordinary, oh, extraordinary and the danger of the space within the village. The status of debris was ambiguous and the people did not know how to deal with it. This ambiguous debris was clearly different from the, uh, from the Juto or any other kind of wastage that emerged within the everyday life and is routinely discharged. The debris did not exactly coincide with Juto, which was shunned as impure. With the debris left unattended, the space within the village also continued to be physically and psychologically unstable and dangerous. In the context of the naval society, supernatural beings such as Boot had been sought to emerge outside the village and outside the houses at night. After the disaster, the Boot had been widely witnessed owing to the drawing of boundaries. The space scattered with debris was simultaneously an ominous and dangerous space in which boot emerges. 
Matter was not explicitly linked directly to boot or death, as it was not perceived as a jut. However, Mato was an invocation of the destruction and terror caused by the disaster. Implying that the space was infested with unstable and ominous boot. As the festival Saparu approached, it was decided that it would be held. Consequently, Matt which was an ambiguous object, became a thing to be discarded and an obstacle. Since Saparu was collectively regarded by all village residents as something that should be practiced together as a village rather than an individual activity, the festival similarly cast the work of removing Mato as the collective work for the village. Even if there is no Mato from the disaster, the people of each neighborhood collaboratively clean up the streets the day before the festival to remove any wastage there. Regardless of the types of disaster, the public aspect of the road is enhanced by making it into the site of a festival. This effect extended to Mato after the earthquake. People removing Mato for Sapalu. There was a shared understanding that the streets that should be worked in festival were not the border lines between the realm of the dead and the living and hence were not zones for supernatural contact. Rather, they were ceremonial venues. This situation could be considered in the discussion of the production of locality. Apadilai states the locality is easy to deconstruct and can only survive if it continues to be produced through actions and discourses that strengthen it. If rituals and customs are not conducted, the relationship among people in the land will be broken. It is extremely difficult to regenerate the relationship once it had, has been deconstructed. Here in P Village, celebrating Sapalu as a community ritual helped people return to cyclical time after disaster. With the decision to conduct the festival, the job of clearing the debris became work which villagers had to do as a community. The removal of the mato was positioned as part of the preparation for the festival. It articulated a group of villagers that should work collaboratively and a space for the community that should be clearing the mato. The matter removal was a strong visual indication to people that the space had been destroyed from the extraordinary and precarious condition brought by the disaster. In the village, in the midst of modernization and urbanization, a variety of festivals and rituals such as Sapalo during normal times functioned as a means of the constant production of locality. However, the residents did not repeat such practices in the exact same forms as had been practiced in the past. Rather, they have been undergoing a constant state of change. Nevertheless, the festivals and rituals have served to remind people of the daily and annual cycles and draw the boundaries of the privilege through the procession. These routines are form of local knowledge, 
that Abadurai mentioned. Locality continues to be produced by festivals and daily practices as local knowledge. Even when the physical boundary of privilege is made fluid by the establishment, ah, sorry, by the earthquake. The earthquake shook the spa spatial areas that were already shaken, uh, uh, shaken by the modernization. The houses were destroyed and the road was blocked by Mato. And people lived in temporary shelters built in downside of village, which was placed not cons uh, consciously regarded by residents as privilege in traditionally. Locality as a structure of feeling had become difficult to continue to produce owing to disaster. The boot rumors can be said to be evidence that the locality was in danger and the space in which people could attain peace of mind was destabilizing. On the other hand, boot and other, uh, others could be interpreted metaphorically as appearing to demand the funerary rites by, performed by the living. The living were also sensitive to the appeal because they had the willingness to mourn the dead. In a psychological sense, Boot played a part of the production of the locality by notifying people of the crisis and demanding a form of funeral ceremony. Supper was held and the dance of Lake circulated in response to the perceiving request to mourn by Boot. The decision was made by people, uh, uh, villagers, and the production uh, to held the supper. The production of, of locality was resumed on this point. Festivals have the power to regenerate locality from the damage caused by the disaster, not only as a conceptual, but also as a physical space. Uh, the Sapalu of 2015 was not only a guide to the afterlife for recently deceased souls, but also a driving force for the renewal of locality in both imaginary and material aspects. The case study in this study reveals that, especially in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, festivals can affect the space of the devastated area, not only emotionally, but also materiality. From this, it can be suggested that the religious practice can be a factor in community resilience and perhaps even disaster preparedness. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sana, for making your ethnographically grounded uh, research. And yeah, it's really nice to see that how the whole question of disaster and the idea of debris uh, could be meaningful for anthropological exploration. And this is a kind of a new genre of scholarship which i think uh, nepal has seen already because the whole experience of disaster i mean the earthquake happened to be uh, 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 happened to be created it had created a moment of uh, i would say a kind of a social scientific uh, imagination a different kind of imaginations which are at play we we are pretty aware of this, uh, that is mostly starting from the works like uh, people like who are hailing from CNAs, uh, they are doing very much and they are doing enough stuff on, on the question of um, disaster, earthquake and post-earthquake social science even. 
and we also even got the opportunity to listen from uh, one of our colleagues friends out there in south asian university she was also having this kind of uh, issues that what a kind of a politics of knowledge is even going on but anyway so this is altogether a different story to tell that how disaster and disaster related debris uh, appears to be a significant passage and that creates a significant passage in maintaining the everyday livelihood so i think the presentation is now open open for discussion and and also question and observations from the participants and as usual i would request our colleague binayak uh, to take this up and deal with the q and a section over to binayak Uh, thank you so much, and uh, Sana. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. We already have two questions uh, coming up. Uh, the first is by our PhD student Sumashridi, uh, and she asks, uh, uh, you know, uh, why do you use the term Gorkha earthquake? Uh, as in your presentation, you have taken the example of a Newar-dominated society. Uh, do you find other instances of usage of the term uh, of the concept of Bhut? In other non-Nevari dominated society, the post earthquake disaster management in the in the valley. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the first question about the Gorka earthquake. Uh, actually, it's Gorka did not mean the uh, the ethnicity, but meaning the uh, the 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 Jilla, Jilla prefecture which the epicenter is placing. I mean, the Golka is not the name of ethnic group, but the name of the place. Uh, so uh, the, the meaning is this. It's, uh, yeah, I, I think. I, I don't know it answers her question. And also, uh, the about the birth in non nevari society, um I uh, actually I'm not sure how much a uh, kind of the rumors of birth in non nevari society. Uh I heard some but usually I'm studying in nevari society so and uh Outside of the naval society, I have not so many uh, experience. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey. No, I think presentation because the house I live in is considered to be a bit haunted. Yeah, uh, I think it uh, transcends sort of. You know. Yeah, uh, when talking about the uh, the situation, not in the disaster period, especially in two thousand fifteen earthquake period, I had so many stories about the boot uh, from the non nevari societies, but especially about the earthquake or disaster related stories about the boot, I, I'm i not sure about that. Yeah, thank you. Second question is by MPhil student, Bhavana Pradhan. Uh, and her question is, has natural disaster like earthquakes in Nepal uh, led to the culture of uh, superstition and how does the younger generation sort of take to this and uh, how do you think this will influence culture society and development in Nepal? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank so, you very much for your question. Did you get that? Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, superstition at the... Hello. Actually, the, the narrative of food most of the narrative of birth about the earthquake is uh, narrated by young people like 20s, 30s, or uh, like teens. 
so uh yeah so even the young people are talking about the rumors about the book but uh but before the earthquake some villagers especially young guides is uh really uh, uh didn't uh, they didn't like the uh, uh ghost stories in this area so they said that i should not make the article about the ghost about the village on that time for this article when i asked them then they said okay but on that time when i'm researching about waste management and sometimes uh, about waste management some ghost stories is arrived about waste management as well ghost stories and the ghost stories and uh, uh, religious stories and they said that it's really superstition things and when you're talking to this story in japan or somewhere then they think nepal is a uh, uh, how to say underdeveloped country underdeveloped state it looks like so so uh, so they don't like that kind of story but after the earthquake younger people also talking about the boot uh, the uh, sound voices of crying voices or the footsteps so it's i don't know how to say that but uh, they have two two perspectives i think and the, so and for my for from my perspective i think it's not uh um, it's not directly influence development or society or culture because it's all a uh, good story it's, it's also a uh, part of culture and society and development in Nepal, especially in this village. Yeah. Hello, I think, yeah, 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 yeah please. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I think that's a very interesting take uh, because, you know, it stems from a certain sort of the existing idea of superstition. Now, we have uh, our, our dear friend Jigmi from Calcutta University uh, who, who asks uh, the role of the modern state uh, in all of this. You know, I mean, what is the role of the state? Didn't they try and clean the debris after the earthquake? Uh, you know, it, because from your pictures, it looks like some very heavy missionary uh, would have, you know, been required to remove the debris as such. And uh, through this, if you could sort of expand on the concept of state society uh, dynamics in the context of debris cleaning after the earthquake. Uh, okay, thank you very much for a question. Uh, in this presentation, I have no time to talking about this aspect. So thank you for making uh, pointed out this point. Uh, the state, Nepali state, uh, especially uh, when talking about the debris in suburban areas or uh, rural areas, uh, uh, Nepali state almost uh, have uh, they do nothing about debris, uh, except only one day they came to this village, uh, very two days, uh, I don't know, uh, five days after the disaster, the earthquake, and they, uh, they, uh, uh, they clean the debris somehow by their own hand. I mean, the, the state uh, army came and they clean some debris, but 
uh, of course, they they can't manage whole village. So and after that, they never came. So people need to clean debris by themselves. I people mean the villagers. So the people, uh, uh, people are uh, raising fund through the internet to the uh, earthquake management before the earthquake, and they collect some money, and they use most part of that money to build the uh, contemporary shelter, but they still have some money remains. So they use that money to charter the heavy vehicles, and people also uh, give the money like the 500 rupees or 1000 rupees to uh chattering the heavy vehicles almost all the families of the village, village the village uh give the donation to that purpose hmm. ah, the heavy vehicle is not the owned by state but owned by the private sector. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Sanana, so, no, no, moving on to the next question. Uh, sorry, sorry, did you? Uh, no, 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 please, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. That was a very interesting question. Now we have a uh, we have our uh, professor from the English department, Kritika, uh, and she likes to know about uh, you know she really likes the way you talked about these new narrative possibilities and you know how you used sort of everyday Nepali words like bhut and mato, which frankly, if I can s speak personally, sort of even struck a chord with me. I knew exactly what you know the imagery, is, so to speak, of what you were talking about. Uh, but here, Kritika wants to know, uh, you know, what does it mean then, you know, to go back to a cyclical order of time? Uh, and does that stem from not having faith uh, in the state mechanism to deal with the aftermath of the quake? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, the uh, when I'm talking about cyclical time, I mean the cyclical time in the local level. Uh, I mean the inside of the village. In the village, people's everyday life have many like rituals and also festivals and the uh, agriculture works in seasonally. So. Uh, so this year we like we harvesting on September. Then next they are uh, prospected to doing same in the next year as well harvesting. Or the the festival the Sapalu is coming on uh, August again and again and again. This kind of cyclical order I'm talking about. So. Uh, uh so uh the state mechanism i i can't get this part properly uh you you mean the if you mean the state uh the nepali government or the local government then the the face about that it's not the going back on this time two or three months after the earthquake uh, i think we can ask kritika to oh yeah 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 yeah. please yes yeah kritika if, if you want to sort of ask the question uh, yourself and to clarify uh, that would be helpful if you can unmute yourself and ask the question uh, oh her mic okay then uh, all right. Why don't you just type out what you want to say? Uh, or can she come? Okay. So yeah, she means the state Nepalese government. It's a little bit difficult, but 
I think people people's face on state mechanism is anyhow not going back on that time. So I'm talking about only for cyclical order inside of the village, really local level. I think uh, if I try to explain okay. what Kritika was uh, trying to make, uh, sorry for intervening in between, is possibly the issue that uh, is it a kind of state failure in relation to the port, post earthquake phenomena? The mm -hmm. state failure, is it opening up the space for mm -hmm. the cyclical time to happen in, in a way through which mm -hmm. Saparu as a festival creates mm -hmm. Uh -huh. its own momentary effect. So that means your position on Saparu vis-a-vis -vis oh. its relationship with the cyclical time and the state's failure in the process, is there a connect that you could see? Probably this might be, if I'm, I'm not sure whether Kritika was trying to mean this, but it sounds me sounds to me like this. I see. So, I, yeah. I understand your point. OK. Uh, yes. The, uh, the, 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 um, mm, it's, it's maybe the one reason it's failure of state of, uh, the, uh, I think, I think, uh, even the state do cleaning the debris, somehow people to uh, people try to get back to cyclical time anyhow i mean even state do work but state people in the village doing something to something to get back to their cyclical time uh, i mean the only state work cannot solve the problem but the one reason which uh, show me clearly about this situation and uh, this uh, this observation is one reason is state failure. Uh, state failure is one reason uh, why I could see the situation more clear. Can can you understand what I? Yeah, I. Okay, I think uh, yeah, Kritika, it's Kritika's question. Probably she is the best person to respond. That whether it's okay or not. Yeah, I think you you have the way I tried to make the problem simplified in in terms to understand that what probably she might have asked. So probably you have responded to the issue. Let's see, and I definitely she will anytime respond. Might be the network is not okay. helpful that way. So, Binak, please continue with the next one. Okay. And now we have another question. I mean, we have a question from Jigmi once again, and this is this is more to do with the stories, so to speak. And he wants to know whether you know usually in our region before any major earthquake or landslide. Uh, that, that there is always this narrative about uh, certain spirits that are crying, you know, which sort of heralds the coming of uh, coming of a disaster, so to speak. You know, uh, did, was there something like this in, in mm -hmm. while you did your field work? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some kind of a premonition, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, to the disaster itself. Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I. Uh, not not in my in this presentation but in my article i uh i referred kawamura who is a japanese scholar uh who is uh, talking about uh, i i mentioned maybe no oh no uh kawamura kawamura talking about this issue uh from the case study of japanese uh, cases he talking about the when after the some tragedy disaster happened, the space it became a contact zone, a kind of contact zone 
which are living and dead or living and supernatural beings are uh, met and conduct. And on that time, usually uh, dead, dead, dead people are coming, coming to living and showing their, uh, their feature or uh, make living to hear their voices to, uh, to, uh, to offer living to make some mourning to them, special mourning. Uh, this, I, I, my study is uh, referring that study and I agree with him somehow. This is one reason why after the disaster, that kind of spirit or ghost stories uh, uh, exploded. Okay, I okay, fine. I actually I, I have a question, but I think I'll just finish the questions and then sort of ask my query. Uh, if I can, you know, just uh, because the theme of the next three questions seem to be quite similar. Mm -hmm. So if the if the questioners don't mind, I'm going to sort of uh, you know fuse in your question, which is basically uh, you know wanting. I mean, the question seems to be. Uh, headed at a direction where they want to know uh, what is the role of a community in the post uh, sort of a disaster scenario uh, and how does you know the advent of modernization and different religious belief tend to affect uh, you know the, the manner in which festivals and rituals are seen uh, especially in the context as you mentioned about producing locality uh, and was there in any way, you know, with the creation of the concept of Bhut, not a creation, but you know, the proliferation of, of the ideas of Bhut and being haunted, so and so, did this somehow affect the village economically or even politically for that matter? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, thank you very much for questions. The, for the community roles or the uh, the changing of the community effects of the changing of the community, uh, I think uh, I think the the rituals and the festivals have the uh, some some role to reproduce locality. Even the modernization happening over a kind of the uh, urbanization or population growth is happening in the locality. So actually, even the P village, which is the study site, the locality, the village, is not the same. And the boundary is actually uh, almost invisible now. Most most gates are already uh, disappeared, and also the 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 area is expanding and expanding every year. But even though they are doing festivals every day in same same period, and on that time they need to gather and doing the same festival as a community. On that time they see the people who are doing festival and the people who are doing festival is their local uh, colleagues locality and also when they are processing the festival then procession route inside of the procession route is a locality the p village so this kind of paradigm and this kind of the reproducing locality is still happening in P village, and this is one reason they can do the uh, disaster management by themselves. And if the, the the urbanization or the paradigm is shift totally, I don't know what happening in the village. But uh, it may be more difficult to uh, to uh, 
reproduce locality again and also uh, when they are not doing like festivals nor rituals anymore then it is difficult for them to uh, manage uh, disaster uh, disaster effects like this way in case study hi yes Maybe next question. Yeah, I think there is problem from Vinayak yeah. side because okay. he is not in Siliguri. Uh, in Kalingpong, the things are not suitable probably in terms of uh, questions and all. So if I am to continue with the thing, so it was with uh, Tajulu's question that you were replying, right? Hmm. Yeah, so now we have Shoshna. Okay. So Sna is also from our center, Center for Himalayan Studies. So she raises a question that saying thanks to you. And she wanted to know uh, with the advent of modernization and different religions, religions, how they infuse in society and what would be the paradigm shift of festival and rituals for the for reproducing the locality. I I think I answered this question together with Tajil one. Okay, we both both you. Yeah. Then you have Yalambar Diman. Yalambar Diman asks that uh, his question is, yeah, Vinayak, now can can you take up now? Oh, I'm so sorry. There was <laughs> light just yeah, went yeah. here. So please please go ahead with Yalambar Yalambar Diman's question. Uh, the, the, can you bring it out because I just lost all my chat. Okay, okay. So Vyalambar Divan, uh, he asked the question that after the earthquake, disaster created a new space of woods and other supernatural beliefs. Those are being created. Uh, he wants to know how this has, uh, how this space affected the people living in the village, maybe in economically, maybe in economic and political sense, mm -hmm. right? The question is uh, that way not very clear. Uh, again, putting it in a way, probably what Yalambar wanted to mean mm -hmm. that how after the post earthquake mm -hmm. or post disaster space creation mm -hmm. in relation to the supernatural belief systems and the idea of the space, how it goes on mm -hmm. parallelly, keeping in view the economic and political mm -hmm. connotations of people's everyday living. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or, to put, or to put it in a way that how mm -hmm. to, to use your own, uh, I mean, conceptual frame, how mm -hmm. both cyclical and linear time could go mm -hmm. parallelly mm -hmm. in a post earthquake situation, in a post disaster situation, where mm -hmm. both this bhut and supernatural belief system is at work mm -hmm. side by side, people's everyday life processes are also at work. Mm -hmm. How in that situation production of space could get affected? And what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. uh... Yeah, the, this the space effect uh, economically economically of course the space is uh, affected and it, uh, as when talking about politically it's a little bit complicated because the political situation on 2015 in Nepal is really uh, really fragile one on that time but so then people is not like not uh uh how to say they they don't they didn't believe in the government or politicians or anyone so they know they do 
the work by themselves usually. Of course, they go to the local government or the, go to the state office or calling some the some politicians and they get sometimes they got some uh aid but usually they didn't believe them i think and the, that economical and political situation is also the one reason the the stability uh, instability instable situation after the aftermath of the earthquake in the area Yes, I, I'm not sure I answered uh, properly, but yeah, it's my answer. Hello, Obinag is there? Hello? I don't think so. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think you have justifiably replied to the question being made. Uh, continuing with the questions, I think, yeah, there is probably no more question. And yeah, if there is any, then they can post their question in the chat box. And we, we have already discussed a lot on the issue. And I think, yeah, uh, this had been a wonderful session. If Binag is back, then I would also request Binag to put his question, as he already mentioned that he was having a question. <laughs> I have a question. It's just the yeah, yeah. Please, 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 please. Yeah, that's or rather the spiritual presence that's not allowing me to ask my question. But I, 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 I just had a question, and and uh, it was more to do with you as a researcher and sort of the background that comes from, uh, because uh, you know with the advent of uh, scientific objectivity and more manner in which disaster management is viewed. Um, issues of booth, all of these things of haunting, etc., would be seen from a very peripheral sort of a manner, right? Uh, now I wonder whether it is. Uh, it's a question to you: Is do you think it's because of the fact that uh, since you know in Japan, um, you, you know, you all are also very sort of you know closely linked with the concept of spirits and haunting and etc. I mean, I think that's the idea we get from watching all your horror movies. Uh, but uh, you know, is, is it why uh, you know uh, that you sort of took this as a very central part of your inquiry? Uh, because, frankly speaking, it, I'm sure I speak on behalf of a lot of other people that uh, I find this this approach very fascinating. Uh, if anything, uh, so. So your question is, I'm sorry, I, I can't get your question. Uh, oh, no, I, I, yeah? I just meant whether, yeah. right. do you yeah. think, it, did, did, you know, why do you think, uh, or rather, you know, is it because of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, your background sort of allows you to, view the you know, see the spirits okay. and ghosts from a much more closer uh, manner than what a Western scholar, or rather even scholars uh, that are more. In Western methods would allow them to see. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, mm, I think I think so. Uh, in Japan, uh, the oh, okay when when I went to field village uh, af after the disaster, uh, three months after the disaster. I heard so many stories about the bird and the ghost, and even not only in the field village, but in the Katamandu, Lalit Pole, uh, there are many kind of the the, uh, the bird stories. And when I heard that stories, I reminded that the uh, the stories of the ghost stories after the 2011 uh, the Great East Japan earthquake and the tsunami. After the tsunami, the in the area of Tohoku area in Japan, uh, there were so many rumors about the ghost. Even in the newspapers, sometimes uh, taking that news, and also many uh, many articles 
Japanese uh, Japanese scholars, uh, especially sociologists and anthropologists, are researching uh, the disaster, tsunami disaster, uh, talking about that ghost stories and ghost. So uh, yeah, so my background is somehow related to this account or this idea. I think. But one reason is people. Really, people are talking about ghost stories after mass of the earthquake in this village. It's one reason. So I, I think this is a, a kind of a, um, mm, special phenomena after mass of the earthquake. Yeah. So there are two reasons, but the one reason is I'm Japanese. So. <laughs> okay. Um. Do, we can uh, this is one more question that just came in we wanted to know whether mm -hmm. and, and this is probably what i meant uh, that uh, you know uh, are ngos playing playing a role in sort of uh, educating people about uh, you know the super you know about the problems in believing supernatural uh, uh, you know remedies to 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 the to, to their current problems okay i First question about energy odds. That's not that right. Energy odds. Uh, I I it's it's difficult to say, but I I don't think energy odds who are who want uh, who are denied the supernatural power it I, I I don't think that the kind of energy odds which denies the supernatural power could save the people in the disaster affected areas uh, supernatural power of course it's it's it may not directly save people i mean the supernatural beings or gods or someone cannot save directly uh, may not save directly the victims but still people uh, for people who are believing such as supernatural beings it have some meaning so I don't think energy odds who wants people uh, apart from that kind of beliefs uh, can cannot save them. I mean the energy odds have the another work, but the, that kind of awareness is not save them, save victims. Okay, thank you so much. I, and I wonder whether it's such a bad thing to believe in in these kind of things. You know, I, I, I'm not sure whether you can just call them super sort of superstitious mm -hmm. beliefs. I, I think they serve a purpose, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure whether they need to be seen as something or believing in stuff like this needs to be seen in something. Um, mm -hmm. as, you know, in in, in a very negative. Way. Um, mm -hmm. Anyhow, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Sana. And now I hand over the thing to Satyadar again. Okay, thank you, Vinayak. And yeah, for coming almost at the fair end of the discussion. Uh, mine is also not a question as such. I also have something to share. And um, thanks, obviously, for this wonderful presentation and. And in a way, a kind of a bottom-up approach towards looking at disaster vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the social reality in which the, the cultural ways of dealing with disaster that had been framed in post earthquake Nepal. I was just wondering that uh, you have used uh, at, one certain, at one point of your discussion, debris as unclean. Right, so that is what I was uh, wondering that if this unclean, because, because you know, and uh, I'm sure that you know this, because mm -hmm. in context like ours, the word unclean is is something 
uh, very significant. I mean, in terms of, uh, if you see it in terms of purity, pollution, relationship, as also caste questions. So uh, I was not very sure that whether your use of Depris as unclean is having that significance or not. And if it is so, then is it like that this debris being unclean uh, mm -hmm. is having or that makes the passage clear to it that mm -hmm. it could have a space in, in the, I mean, the linear time that you have formulated. Mm -hmm. Linear time meaning a kind of continuation from the past and towards an unknown future. Mm -hmm. So unclean debris, mm -hmm. linkage with wood, and what else? Uh, Lakhe, mm. the festivals like Lakhe, mm. and the passage towards a linear time. Is it like that, the argument that you tried to uh, build up? That's what I was just just trying to make it sure that, yeah, it, if it is like that, we can follow your argumentation in that path or not. Please, yeah. if you can. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much for your clarification. Um, yeah, unclean, the, uh, debris is, uh, the, the, some scholars said debris, uh, 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 the, uh, sorry, the victims said debris as unclean. And I thought so, but after I, uh, entered the field site, I, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I was not sure it's unclean or not. People never use the word juto. It means unclean or impure in this study area, and people never used that word towards the debris. But still, there were many boot stories, and and the there were many uh, instable situations there. And the, so I thought that the, I, I can say that the debris in this village shows the instable situation uh, as visually, but I can't say uh, directly that it's connected to boot or a dead person or the uncleanness from the death. Uh, but still, uh, the, it is one reason that the, the, uh, the, my argument, one, uh, no, it, it is one part of my argument that the linear time, which is unstable and insecure and the super, uh, the, uh, so uh, uh linear time so uh yeah so so yeah this is my argument so matu and butu both shows the instable situation uh, uh, uh both is a kind of symbol of the instable situation but of the very aftermath of the earthquake and uh linear time which the victims should had to live. And because of Sapalu, the situation is changed. And the, again, the debris showed the, uh, that change uh, visibly. So, yes, yeah, so this is my argument. Okay. okay. Thank you, Zana, for, for your reply and making your position clear on the issue that I raised. And yeah, and one one simple one thing, well, this this is just my wild guess. It's not a question as such. I was just wondering that you were using almost uh, many a time that your study area was in a field side, which was probably a village, village P kind of a thing. But the photographs that you were sharing, that we were just wondering that Every time there were multiple, I mean, uh, buildings having multiple story, multi storied buildings, I, I mean to say, uh, though they were being affected. But I was just wondering that a village or is it a kind of a urban complex? Uh, that's what the field site was being located. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, one locality. 
Yeah, one look. Uh, I mean, the, uh, it's called the village, but actually it's urbanizing. Uh, it's urbanizing now. I mean, the urbanization is happening in this village. So it's a kind of uh, suburban area of Kathmandu metropolitan city now. But still people call that place village. And also uh, the second reason of the, the multi-street buildings, uh, multi-street buildings is a traditional style of Nepal buildings. So even in village areas in Nepal, they have the same style buildings, like three street, street three floors or four floors. So both is reason that it looks like not a kind of rural uh, situation. Okay, thank you. Got, got it, that it, it had been a suburban area nearby to Kathmandu main city space. Yeah, yeah I think uh, there is no question anymore as such. So, uh, from the part of the department, I mean the Center for Himalayan Studies and all my colleagues out there and all students who have been participated, who have been participating in these kind of lectures. And for, on behalf of all of them, I thank you to come over on this day and sharing your views and agreeing to uh, be with us for more than an hour. And we have really enjoyed and this had been a very engaging discussion floor that had been created out of your presentation and thank you again for coming up and we will solicit your engagement in future as well and i have been seeing that you are also engaging with our sessions as well in previous all three sessions you were there so mm -hmm. that's a great thing that you also keep interest in whatever we are doing so uh, and also on behalf of the department i would also like to thank your supervisor for uh, Turning, out, turning over to this discussion and also another friend, another colleague might be that I don't know, the name is not there, uh, from Japan probably, he or she might have also joined. I thank also him or her as well from the part of the center. Yeah, so let us say goodbye. Bye-bye. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very much. Okay. So see you. And thank then, you. Uh, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the, this opportunity. Thank you. Right. Okay, then. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm just getting out of the session, right? Yeah. Okay.